Greetings in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to Sunday service. And I trust that you continue to grow in the Lord from week to week, even as we pass through this time of a lockdown. And um, I will wish to meet face to face with many of you again, but uh, the circumstances by which the lockdown has not made it easy or uh, possible. Although we can, when the Lord enables us to travel uh, by supernatural transportation, but until the Lord releases that, we continue to do our best through whatever technology or system that we can. Uh, at the moment in Australia now, we are not able to really travel out except for government business or some really important things because uh, uh, now with the little bubbles opening up, travel bubbles, uh, for Australia, at least, uh, for some of the countries I know, like Singapore or other places, uh, you can you, you're allowed to travel in and out much easier, uh, except depending on the host country. But for for us Australians, if we travel out, uh, we might not be able to come back easily because there's a restriction of how many people are allowed to come back. At first, it was four thousand, but they then uh, expanded to six thousand. And there is a long queue for Australians coming back. And so they have to apply uh, for permission to return back. So until everything is back to normal, uh, let's continue on to do the best that we can through online fellowship or other means. And those of you who can meet each other, I encourage you, go out together once in a while and as permitted until the COVID-19 uh, restrictions in your host country, in your country, and uh, without breaking any laws. But I believe fellowship is important. So we'll get back to fellowship. And uh, then the other thing is uh, I would love to travel only without those quarantine things. Because if you get quarantined twice, it's like losing one whole month trap in a place. Uh, even no matter how good that place is, it's just a sense of not being able to go out and uh, do things. And so 14 days and 14 days back is not going to be ideal. And because uh, there's some things that you just miss to, and you just want to go out to fellowship or to just uh, take a walk kind of thing. And um, so let's pray that the world will slowly go back to normal and, uh, and churches can meet as normal and then we can be able to go into more uh, helping each one in the church to grow uh, in various places. In the meantime, we are on this little series on Revelation and Miracles. We touch about how uh, when there's a period of Revelation, it, it always uh, uh, brings forth a miracle where God shows that He authenticated the Revelation Reveal. Or, or, or to understand the fact that all miracles are based on something that God is trying to reveal to us so that we don't get caught up in the miracles and live only for miracles and the miracle, enjoy the miracle and then we forgot that there was a message behind the miracle and we missed the whole point altogether. When Jesus came as a Messiah, thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands in His, life, in, in his generation received miracles. I believe there were, there were more than recorded because John himself testified that if everything that Jesus did, and John followed Jesus very closely, I mean three years is a lot. In one day Jesus could heal hundreds of thousands of, of people. Uh, and so John who walked closely with Jesus said that if all the things that Jesus said and did were recorded, there are no books not enough books to contain that. So there is a lot. And a lot of people were beneficiaries of the miracles, signs and wonders of Jesus. But at the end of the day, and this is very concerning, at the end of the day, when Jesus went to the cross and He died, 
then later resurrected and only appear to those believers after his resurrection. So for unbelievers, they still have no clue what happened. I wondered how many people realize that the miracles, the signs and wonders were pointing towards something and they forgot what it was pointing to. They get engrossed in the hype excitement of the miracles even when Jesus was dying on the cross when no miracle was happening and he was being mocked and jeered say if you're a son of God come down and all kinds of taunting were happening they didn't realize all the miracles, all the signs and wonders, all the teachings, all the glory shown was for that moment on the cross of Calvary when he died and became the Lamb of God to save all of mankind and all creation. The glorious moment in which she was at the cross where no miracle was permitted except that the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God. That was the greatest miracle. But yet no one saw it. So it is concerning. It is concerning that in two ways. That we do need miracles today. We do need God to manifest and no one is waiting on God and praying diligently and preparing themselves for it. And at the same time, it's concerning that when miracles do come, that people miss what the message of miracle was and got consumed in the excitement and the delights of miracle, forgot the main message behind what the miracles was trying to say. So on both sides, one without the miracle that needs a miracle, one the miracle and need to remember the message of miracle. Both these points of time are very concerning. That is why we teach this message and we warn and tell you beforehand, do not get caught up with the hype of the miracles and forget the message. By all means, get excited, rejoice, live for joy, dance and, uh, and, and, and keep living for joy from, from wherever you are, from corner to corner, from town to town, whatever you want in rejoicing in the Lord. But don't forget the message behind the miracles. And in the meantime, don't be lazy, grow in the Lord, Pursue after God, pray and believe in a time of miracles that is coming. So both these emphases we must do. That when God reveals himself, as the time comes to God's fullness of time, he will manifest in miracles. Which is where we come to this point in our teaching of Revelation and Miracles to show forth that there is indeed a time of miracles coming. And here are the reasons why we believe there's a time of miracles coming. And reason number one. Second Thessalonians Chapter 2, looking at verse 9 to 12. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. 
For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth by pleasure in unrighteousness. First reason is the devil himself is coming with signs and wonders and those signs and wonders must be challenged by genuine and true authentic signs and wonders. God will always confront every line, sign, and wonder with the genuine ones. Just as Moses confronted the false magicians of Egypt. Can you imagine, even before Moses appeared on the scene, those magicians must have been turning sticks into snakes by some evil power. They're doing that all the time until God showed up and ate up all their rods and something happened to them after that day. Because if their incantation depends on the rod, all their rods disappear and God literally removed their ability to do those kinds of signs and wonders again. Now that's like on a negative point side, just because there's signs and wonders from the enemy, God's going to do his genuine. But you can rephrase this point also in the sense that if the devil comes with signs and wonders, this gospel that we are bearing, that we go forth to preach, comes with signs and wonders. Yes, my friends. The fullness of the preaching of the gospel will always come with signs and wonders. Some of the verses we already touched on in this series, but we just run through them. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, Paul says, remember this New Testament is the apostles going forth with the gospel that the signs and wonders of an apostle were wrought among the church, the disciples of God, with signs and wonders, with perseverance. So this gospel, point number one, the devil comes with signs and wonders, this gospel comes with signs and wonders. This message that God has given to us comes with signs and wonders. And in Hebrews, besides 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Hebrews chapter 2, it, said, it talks about this message that we had in chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drive away. For if the word spoken through angels proves, proves steadfast and every transgression and disobedience receive a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His will. This gospel will always be preached with signs and wonders. Doesn't matter if for the, in our recent years or of Christianity that nobody is preaching the gospel with signs and wonders. Remember what I say about right doctrine, wrong doctrine? The correct doctrine is that this gospel of Jesus Christ must be preached with signs and wonders. We need to renew our mind to that. We have lived so long in evangelicalism, preaching the gospel without signs and wonders, that we preach without signs and wonders, and we didn't expect signs and wonders. That is wrong teaching, wrong understanding. Yes, I agree. The 
the gospel, the message is itself so brilliant and a wonder by itself. But it must always be accompanied by God sanctioning it, signs and wonders. Still, the Apostle Paul made this statement in Romans chapter 15. Says in verse 18 and 19 and 20. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed. To make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yes, amen to that. The gospel of Jesus Christ must always be preached with signs and wonders. Again, Many of us receive the gospel without signs and wonders. Some of us might have, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't change the fact that we need to go forth and preach with signs and wonders in God. It's just part and parcel of the full gospel message. Also, in First uh, Corinthians, Chapter 2, Paul makes this statement in verse 4. And my speech and my preaching were not with, device, were with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So again, this gospel must be preached not in word only but indeed in signs and in wonders remember when john sent a message to jesus say are you the one jesus went about healing teaching preaching and then he told the disciples to go back to john and tell him what they saw the blind see the lame walk and go and tell john what you saw he did not directly answer john's question are you the one but he wants John to form his own opinion and faith about Jesus with signs and wonders. And Jesus told his disciples not to leave Jerusalem in Luke chapter 24-49 until they be endued with power from on high. And in Acts 1 verse 8, they were told to tear in Jerusalem until they be anointed with power from on high. Finally, Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came down and they were anointed with power from on high. So the first point is that the message of God, just like the message of Satan from the false uh, prophet and from, from the false from the Antichrist, will be with signs and wonders. The message that truly is from God Almighty of our Jesus, our Lord and Master, will also be accompanied with signs and wonders. It's part and parcel of the thing. So today we bring you to the expectation. Remember the two things I'm concerned of on Revelation and Miracles. One, when the miracles happen, people forgot the message behind the miracles. That one, we will ensure that we keep repeating when the miracles start happening we will tell people look not just a miracle remember the message behind the miracle but in this time before the ushering in of the age of miracles signs and wonders again we need to prepare ourselves for that to give ourselves to god for that and in order to encourage us to do so, we show forth from the Bible why signs, wonders and miracles are important and why they are coming. Number one, the gospel of Jesus Christ is always accompanied by signs and wonders. Just as the enemy, the Antichrist when he comes, will also have signs 
and wonders. Number two, turn to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. He says in verse 11, he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the edifying of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be true and tossed and fro carry about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man the crafting come craftiness but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ point number two why signs and wonders are necessary why they are coming upon us. Number two. Number one, the gospel is always accompanied with signs and wonders. Number two, and the enemy likewise. And number two, the church will reach the fullness of Christ. And this fullness of Christ is so powerful that it will result in signs and wonders. How can you become the fullness of Christ without manifesting power and authority over the elementary principles of this world? And when you read chapter 5 also, and it talks about the bride and the church, and it's speaking not just of the uh, marriage relationship, it's also talking about the great mystery of Christ. He says in verse 28, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. I speak of Christ in the church. And the glorious church, look at what it's like. It says verse 25, Husbands love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And Jesus is giving himself to the church because he loved us. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself. He's bringing the church into a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Point number two, the glorious church is glorious. It's perfect. It's the fullness of Christ. It is the flesh of his flesh and the bone of his bone. If Jesus was the fullness of God, the church bears the fullness of God. Now, when God manifests in His fullness, there is bound to be signs and wonders and the superseding of natural laws. So, 1,000% there will be signs and wonders in a glorious church when the church is perfected. That's point two. Point three. John chapter 14. In John 14, Jesus talk about his oneness with God. I call in this third point the John 17. The John 17 phenomenon. 
where in John 17 Jesus pray for one main thing that the church be one with the Father and with Jesus the word oneness is applied many times in John 17 and this time it includes us not just Jesus Jesus has always been one with the Father but in John 17 he prayed that the church be, be one with each other and one with Jesus and one with the Father so that the Father is in, in the Son and the Son is in the Father the Father is in the church church is in the Son and in the Father this oneness takes away the John 17 phenomena now the John 17 phenomenon is spoken of by Jesus himself. He says in verse 6, John 14, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If ye had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said, show us the Father is sufficient for us. Jesus said, Have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me, that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves so jesus said everything that he did is from the perspective that he is one with the father and the father is in him then he turns around and say in verse 12 and 13 most assuredly i say to you he who believes in me the works that i do he will do also and greater works than these he will do because i go to my father Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So he says, everything that you see me do in these three years is because the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. Then he turns around and says, you are going to be one in me and I'm going to be one in you. Thus, what twelve takes place, the works that I do, you will do also. So the third reason why I'm expecting great signs and wonders is because in this end time, the church will become so one with Jesus that you cannot be any more one. It will reach a fullness of oneness with God. And Jesus even told the disciples that. If you find it in verse uh, 11, if you find it difficult to believe that I'm in the Father, Father in me, at least believe it because you see the result, the works, the signs, the wonders, the miracles. So you know that I and the Father are one. He told his disciples that. These Jesus spoke to his disciples. But the amazing thing was that these are words he also spoke to those who find it hard to believe in him or all people, Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said to them in the book of John chapter 10 when they find it hard to believe that he is one with God. He said in verse 34, John chapter 10 Is it not written in your law, I say you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. If, and listen carefully, he says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But, if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Now that's almost the same like in talking to the disciples. I said he talked to them in a uh, different way, telling them that if they find it hard to believe that the Father is in him, believe the works. Now he tells the Pharisees and the people he preached to, saying, 
I'm in the Father, Father in me. If you find hard to believe that, look at the works. If there are no works, you don't have to believe. But if there are works, you are now demanded to believe that Jesus and the Father are one. Wow. They don't have to believe it. There were no works. We should be able to say the same like Jesus when He becomes perfectly one with us and the Father one with us and dwell in us. This indwelling of God in His fullness in our lives. You can say this John 17 one also equals the third temple. We are the third temple. Where the fullness of God will be in us. Now tell me, when that happens, how can there not be any miracle? So definitely, we are heading towards those times of miracles. John 17 or the temp third temple effect is going to take place in our life. Number one, because the gospel comes with signs and wonders. That's most important. Number two, the glorious bride will always defy all the laws of nature. Number three, John 17, the oneness we got, we the third temple, in fact, will always have signs and wonders. We are giving you reasons why you have to believe in a time of miracles coming and what's coming is going to be astounding. In a, we are heading towards one of the most miracle-filled era of humanity. Greater than that which was before, because Jesus prepared us for this time and is still through Jesus, who multiplies himself through us today. We need to awaken the fact that he is manifesting. Number four, the kingdom of God. When Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, it was from the context of the transfiguration. And each time he talked about the kingdom of God coming in the most glorious way. And you can add Daniel 2.44 to the fact that in the days of the Tentos, God sets up the kingdom. The Tentos were not around in Jesus' time. Jesus prepared for us. The Tentos are around in our time. And that is why when the kingdom of God is set up, we will see the most astounding, spellbounding, amazing time of signs and wonders and miracles that humanity has ever seen before. Jesus said in verse 27, 28 about such a time setting up the kingdom. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste there till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. So he says, it's going to happen as a sample. Some are here who will see that kingdom. But there is a future happening in fullness. That's implied. Six days later, in verse 17, Jesus took Peter, James and John. And as they end of the mountain, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, speaking and talking with him. You will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Also in Mark 9, and we read a verse at the end of Mark chapter 8, it says, 
in verse 38 for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him the son of man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father <clears throat> with the holy angels and he said to them assuredly i say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste that till they see the kingdom of god present in power the word present is the word ekomai that can also be translated as they see the kingdom of god come in power so my fourth reason for believing this era of miracles is coming is number four the kingdom of god in power is indeed coming forth now forgetting luke also in chapter 9 Jesus again makes this um, prediction in Luke chapter 9. Let's read the tail end of it. Verse 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. So he's all the time preparing for this coming of the kingdom in the days of the Tentos. And that's in our time. And so he came to pass after eight days, he was taken out, he prayed, and there was a glory of God shown. Kingdom of God will come with great signs and wonders and power. Our fourth point is there is our privilege in our time that God has chosen in days of Tentos to set up His kingdom. You can be sure it will be great thunder, lightning, signs and wonders such as a world has never seen before. So we are in the approaching time of great signs and wonders because number one the gospel of Jesus Christ will always be accompanied by signs and wonders just as the message of the Antichrist will also be delivered with four signs and wonders number two the pure bride of Jesus finally reached its glorious point our time also it's gonna happen in our time number three the presence of god in us the oneness of god in us an establishment of the third temple of god within us the indwelling of god within us is so powerful never before in any age has it been demonstrated i say our age gonna come into us the presence of god there will be resulting signs and wonders Number four, the kingdom of God will indeed come in the days of the Tentos and establish himself permanently here. So great and so big, so powerful that it literally break in pieces every kingdom before it. Kingdom of Babylon, kingdom of Middle Persia, kingdom of Greece, kingdom of the Roman Empire, all will be broken down and blown away as does as this kingdom of God expand north, south, east, west even as it is established we are looking forward to signs and wonders by god and the fifth point that we have all these are very glorious but the fifth point why are we expecting and a dimension or era of miracles coming upon mankind prepare ourselves prepare for it for that 
We turn to Second Corinthians chapter three. Now in Second Corinthians in chapter three Paul says this statement in verse nine onwards. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceed much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. For this account, I want to point to the glory that came on Mount Sinai. It was such awesome glory and that's just Old Testament and the New is even more glorious. Turn with me if you please to the book of Exodus and around um, let's look at the Lord coming down of there around chapter 19 onwards Israel and Mount Sinai so he says there in verse 16 then it came to pass on the third day in the morning there were thunderings and lightnings and a third thick cloud on a mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. We're going to bring you to meet face to face with God created in His glory. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain great, quaked greatly. It was a quake caused by the presence of God. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, oh, because louder than that, louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. Now this is the Old Testament. The fifth point is in the New Testament. The glory of God which surpasses the old is going to descend and come upon each one of us. There will be side effects upon all that is around. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we read on and say, it says here that the ministry of righteousness exceeds the ministry of the law verse 12 of St. Corinthians 11 St. Corinthians 3 verse 11 if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great bonus of speech. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing. But their minds were blinded for until this day, the same way remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. But he says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. 
Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all we are with, we all we are with face beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. I've been transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Ah, oh, what presence! This awesome glory, just as in the Old Testament it was the establishment of the law. In the New Testament, we have reached after two thousand years the establishment of grace, which is much more glorious than the old covenant. And this glory that God is going to show is not just on the earth that cause our effect; it's going to be upon each one of us. In the Book of Romans, chapter eight. Paul says this word. It's like, it's like Paul knew there is a time of one that's coming. In verse eighteen, let's read chapter eight. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And he talks about all creation. This creation is groaning to give birth. On point five, there is this birth of the glorious sons of God, a manifestation of grace upon mankind. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing. Of the sons of God, we will rise to the fullness of being sons of God. The manifestation of the glory of His grace. Old Testament reveal the manifestation of the law. New Testament manifestation of grace. Old Testament reveal Moses the servant. New Testament reveal sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered. This created earth, Hallelujah. Will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together. Until now, when Paul talks about time coming, when creation will give birth to us, the fullness of God. Sons of God, the manifestation of the grace of God upon our lives. Now there are many other points to establish the coming signs and wonders, but it is in our time that God is going to manifest five different results. That will bring signs and wonders to each of our lives. Number one, restoration of the fullness of the preaching of the gospel with signs and wonders. Just as the enemy comes with signs and wonders, we come with the gospel, signs and wonders. Number two, the glorious church will be established in fullness. Number three, the fulfillment of the perfect oneness that is formed between us and Jesus and God is going to be manifest in our time. Number four, 
the kingdom of God that will be established in our time. Number five, the sons of God, the ministry of grace which surpasses the ministry of the law. Countless innumerable ways will show forth signs and wonders. So these are the things you're excited about. They're going to bring about glory. What should be our response? Number one, we must believe, have excited faith about that which is to come. Number two, we must prepare for it when the time draws near. Give ourselves to God. Prepare ye, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So we must prepare our lives for this coming era of signs and wonders. So that we are in the front when this wave hits. Hallelujah. Number three, we must hunger for it. Like Elisha hungry for the anointing upon Elijah. We must hunger. Jesus is the Son of God. We are all sons of God, anointed to do what He did. That is our privilege. That is our joy. Believe. Prepare. And hunger for it. And then be at the right place at the right time to receive this coming glory that God is bringing forth to this planet. Just as the disciples have to go to the right place and the right time to wait. They were in the upper room waiting when it happened. We will be in whatever place ready, calling upon God to manifest all five areas in fullness before Him. We thank You. We praise You. We worship You, Lord. Bless these who are here. Let them enter and prepare for these signs and wonders that we predict is coming forth. That when it comes, it will go even beyond all our expectation. And it will be glorious living in this glory that God has for us. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. In Jesus' name. Amen.